Reagan, Reagan, I need one of those, baby. Thank you, honey. Grab these. All right. We're going to be in Genesis 17 tonight for the next few minutes. Genesis 17. What you looking for, Doc? Oh, there somewhere. RC. RC, take half of those and get somebody to help you, babe. Get somebody to help you, hon. Brother Benji will help you if you'll help him. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Uh -uh. Thank you, babe. All right, Genesis 17. <clears throat> an interesting chapter, and it is a transitional chapter in the life of Abraham, and in fact, the entire Word of God. For in it, we see a lot taking place. There's a lot happening here in this chapter. So last Wednesday night, Abraham was 86 years old. 86 years old. This week he is 99 years old. Aren't you glad you don't age like that? Uh -huh. Verse number 1 says, And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generation for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and unto thy seed after thee. I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God said unto Abram, Abraham now, thou shalt keep my covenant herefore, or therefore thou and thy seed after thee, in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep. Again, notice that. That's important. Verse number 10 tells us once again, whose covenant is it? It's not a covenant between Abraham and God. It's a covenant between God and Abraham. It's a covenant from God to Abraham. God is the only one making a covenant here. Abraham is the recipient of that covenant. Notice what Abraham's part is. Nothing. Just receive it. Isn't that good? That is a picture of grace. That's a picture of salvation. It's a picture of so many things. God's goodness bestowed to us because we deserve it? Absolutely not. Because he loves us? Absolutely. Because he wants to? Absolutely. Because he desires to? Absolutely. And look at this. Now, uh, this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man, child among you shall be circumcised. Now let's stop right there and let's move down for the sake of time to verse number 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy, thy, thy wife, Thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abram, Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him? that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear. And Abraham said unto God, O that Ishmael might live before thee. 
God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I blessed him, will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this time, set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. Now let's stop right there. And uh, the rest of the chapter there deals with Ishmael, and it, does, it deals with uh, circumcision. Uh, and Abraham carrying that out with himself and his son Ishmael and the rest of, his, uh, the, rest of the men that were born in his house. All right, so in Genesis 17, at the age of 99, at the beginning of that chapter, God tells Abraham to grow up. He tells Abraham to grow up. You say, preacher, where do you see that? Well, it's right there at the end of that verse. He says, uh, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, why do I say God told him to grow up? Because we've seen some pretty immature things out of Abram up to this point, have we not? Now, the rest of the time that we spend looking at Abram, and I've been hard on Abram over the last few Wednesday nights. I have. Preacher's been hard on him, and I'm not trying to be overly critical, because like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if when I get to heaven, Abram doesn't walk up to me and punch me right in the mouth for saying those things about him. But if there's anybody that knows what foolishness is, it's me, because I live it. I've learned it. I practice it. Practice makes perfect. I'm pretty good at doing dumb things. And so I'm pretty good at recognizing them as well. Now, I understand I'm not, uh, I shouldn't be trying to tell, tell everybody about how bad Abraham is when I can't get my own self straightened out, but nevertheless, uh, we can call it like we see it there. And we've seen Abraham do some immature things. But now, from the rest of our time, we're going to see Abraham, for the most part, we're going to see him do righteous things. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? Now, if Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, then, and that's what made him righteous, then what do the righteous do? They do right. And so if Abraham's going to be righteous in the eyes of God, or because he's been deemed righteous in the eyes of God, because of God's grace, then he should do everything he could possibly do to be right. Amen? You and I likewise. We've believed God. It's been accounted to us for righteousness. Not our works that make us righteous, but our belief that makes us righteous. But because God's counted our belief to, as righteousness, you and I should strive to be right. And that's what God's telling him there when he says, I want you to be perfect. That word perfect means holy. Uh-oh. You know what's amazing to me? The Bible says, be ye holy as I'm holy. Well, I can't do that. That's why God doesn't judge us according to that standard. I'm saved by grace. But I will tell you this, my Christian walk will be judged according to that standard. Not my eternal salvation, my eternal estate is settled. I am saved to the uttermost. From the guttermost to the uttermost, that's how saved I am. That cannot be taken away. But my spiritual walk is determined based on my righteousness or lack thereof. The way that I live my life. God told him, he said, be thou perfect. Now, number two, uh, we see that God promised to make Abraham a father of many nations. A father of many nations. Now, this is not the first time God's promised to make Abraham a father, to make Abram a father. But notice this, the last time God made Abraham a promise, or then Abram a promise to become a father, we see that Abram took things upon himself. He got ahead of God. And he made himself a father. Along with Sarah and their crazy concocted idea, uh, they came up with a plan that was ahead of God's time. And what do we see? We see a mess being made as a result of that. But now when we look at it, we see your God says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Not you're going to go out and do it on your own. Uh, he said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And I think that's important, that God is going to make Abram a father of many nations. Now, Calvin said this. He said, Abram, therefore, was not called the father of many nations because his seed was to be divided into many nations, 
but rather because many nations were to be gathered together unto him. The word there is gathered. And I think that is one of the most brilliant statements that I have ever read about Abram and the promise that God made to him. <clears throat> Let me try to explain that to you. God said he was going to make Abraham, or Abram, then Abraham, of the father of many nations. Now we look at that, and from a purely physical standpoint, we can see that there are several, several nations that stemmed from Abraham's seed. We see there are, of course, the Israelites. That's the Jewish people that exist today. The Ishmaelites. Those are the many of the Arabs that exist today. Likewise, the Midianites are also descendants of Abraham. The Moabites are descendants of Lot, but yet of his family, if you will. But of his seed directly, you see those and, and, and so many others that we see today. In fact, if you really measured it up, I should suppose that quite a few of the Arab nations are descendants of Ishmaelites. But now all that being said, I believe, as Calvin said, that God had other means or other definitions for why he was going to be a father of many nations. You see, he talks about there not because his seed was to be divided and, okay, so part, Ishmael's going to go and he's going to become the father of this people. Uh, Isaac's going to go and become the father of the 12 tribes of Israel and, and all of this and, 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 and everything's going to stem out from there. No, 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 no. I think it's much more than that because Abraham is the father of all them that believe. The father of all them that believe. So when you look, it's not that everybody is going to, all the crowd that's going to be the direct lineage of Abraham, but those who are the lineage of the descendants of Abraham by faith. Does that make sense? And that number is beyond number. That number is beyond counting. It is as God has promised, as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the sea. And we see that number is, 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 is extraordinary. In its, uh, in its enormity. And so we look at that and we see that uh, the nations, it's about the nations that were to be gathered unto him, gathered together unto him. Uh, number four, in Genesis 17, 5, God changes Abram's name to Abraham. Now I've done a, as good a job as I could do over the last 10 lessons before tonight to make sure that I called Abraham Abram. For the next 10 lessons, I'll be trying to remember to call Abram Abraham from now on. But we see that God changed his name. And the reason why God changed his name is because it means a father of a multitude or father of many. That's what the name Abraham means. Father of many. Now, I talked about this being a turning point because of the, not necessarily the number of promises that God makes to Abraham, he makes one covenant with him. But the effects and the impacts of that covenant are massive. They are huge. They impact everything else, not only in the Word of God, uh, you know, in the 66 books of the Bible that we have, but it impacts all of history since then. In fact, it impacts all of history before then as well. Because even going back to Genesis chapter number 3, that needed this to happen for that to be fulfilled. In fact, God giving the first Adam was necessary to get us to this point where we could have the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm giving things away now, but number five, Abraham has also promised that kings will flow from him. The most important king being King Jesus. King Jesus. Now, I want to point something out to you. The reason why, and if you have a, a copy of the notes with the answers already on them tonight, you'll notice that I did in my notes put simply Jesus. Well, why did I put Jesus and not Jesus Christ? And I'll tell you quite simply, it's because Jesus Christ, the Christ, is not a descendant of Abraham. Now, I want to, I want to draw that distinction. That's important. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 9, verse number, sorry, in Isaiah chapter 9, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Are you with me? That child was born. That's the Lord Jesus. That's his humanity. Are you with me? But now, Christ came 
into this world. Are you with me? And he is not the seed of Abraham. He is the only begotten Son of God. Are you with me? Now, they're one and the same. Don't get me wrong. But I want you to know, has anybody ever heard the old McCamey song? I think it's the McCameys that sing it. Uh, he was so much man that he slept in the boat, but he was so much God that the wind ceased when he spoke. That's a good song. That's a pretty good song. I encourage you. If you've never heard it, you go listen. Is it the McCameys? You like the McCameys, is it? All right. I got a witness. Now, it ain't the McCameys. Who is it? I hear the lady singing it. I think it's Peg. I imagine she had her shoes off too when she sung it. I don't know. If she sung it, she had her shoes off. I guarantee it. <clears throat> I don't think she could sing Be Right With God without her shoes on or without her shoes off. Now, uh, but now we've got to figure that out. We're going to have a battle after church and figure out who in the world sang that song. I, now, um, but, she pro but, but the, the promise to him was that King Jesus was going to come through him. The seed of Abraham, the seed of David. But what it's amazing is when you look at the scriptures, the gospel tells us that he is the seed of Abraham, but he's also the root of Abraham. I believe it was Dr. Lutzer I was listening to this morning that was talking about that. I didn't think about talking about it tonight when I heard it this morning. But it's amazing. How could he be the descendant of Abraham, but also the root or the predecessor of Abraham, that Abraham come from him, and yet he came from Abraham. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Why do I love it? Because it shows us that before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And when you look in the scriptures and you see over in the garden of Gethsemane, when the crowd came with sticks and staves to take the Lord Jesus into custody, and they said, we're looking for Jesus, and Jesus said, I am he. And when he said, I am, they fell to the ground. Now they fell on their backside. But the next time they stand before him, they'll fall forward onto their knees. They'll bow. They'll be proscudine. That word proscudine means to be face down in worship. Now, they may not do it out of desire, but they'll do it out of dictate. They'll do it either out of a heart of love, or they'll do it as a result of divine judgment. But he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. There are 39 kings of Judah and Israel besides Saul and David and Solomon that ruled over either the southern kingdom of Judah or the northern kingdom of Israel. And during those times of the divided kingdoms and all those kings, some were good, some were bad, all from the northern kingdom were bad, some from the southern kingdom were good. But when you look at all of that, You'll see that of all the things that, that, that were done, of how the borders of Israel were increased, and others, they increased their lands, and some increased their wealth, and others caused it to contract. Some did good things, some did horrific things, and yet none of them can compare to the Lord Jesus and who he is and what he does. We read about good King Hezekiah, the revival under Josiah. We read about the wickedness of Ahab. We read about the, 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 the childishness of Rehoboam, the sinfulness of Jeroboam, the riches of Solomon, the love and the pursuit of God's own heart of David, and the goodliness of Saul. But you can take the best qualities of all of them that were the seed of Abraham, put them all together, and they still pale in comparison. If you were to, uh, if you were to uh, compound all of their good qualities, they would still be as wretched dogs if you compared them to the Lord Jesus. Uh, oh, the king that descended from him, the whole reason that all those other kings were born is so that that one could come. And he has come now. And I'll tell you this, that there have been other kings since him, but none like him. Him. There may be other kings still until he comes again, but there'll be none that can compete. There'll be none that can measure up. There'll be none that can qualify uh, uh, to be near equal with him because he is that king of kings and lord of lords. So he's the promised king uh, of that covenant there. Number six, Genesis 17, 8. Indisputably declares that Abraham's seed owns the land of Canaan. C-A-N-A-A-N. Verse number 8. I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So hold on just a minute now. I want you to bear with me, and I want you to pay close attention to what I'm about to say. Carefully now. 
If you don't listen to what I'm saying, you can misconstrue it. And I don't want you to do that. You can take me wrong. This verse does not in any way settle the dispute about whose property Jerusalem and Israel is between the Arabs and the Israelis. Why? We can go back to a previous question tonight. God promised to make Abraham the father of many nations. And I've already said tonight that flowing from Abraham's seed are not only the Israelites, but the Ishmaelites and the Edomites. I missed that one earlier. The Edomites, the Midianites, all of these are descendants of Abraham. So the Ishmaelites today, the descendants of Ishmael, some of the Arabs, would possibly, according to that verse, be able to lay some sort of a claim to Jerusalem, to Israel, or Canaan's land. Does that make sense? So how do we know that God intended that, not for the descendants of Ishmael, but for the descendants of Israel? Well, it's very clear. Over in, verse, over in the latter part of the chapter now, we looked at it in verse number 21. We see in the previous verses that God said he was going to bless Ishmael, going to give him 12 princes, going to make a great nation out of him. But verse 21, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac. Do you see that? Which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Now, folks, what you see right there is clear, incontrovertible evidence that God declared that that land is to belong to Israel, to the descendants of Abraham through Isaac, not of Ishmael. Now they'll be raised, and they'll live in the presence of his brethren. That's what the scripture said of Ishmael's children, and of Ishmael and his sons. But nevertheless, that land that is being... Do you know that we had a mess this week in the United Nations? Anybody see that? And thank God for Nikki Haley. Anybody know who she is? She was the former governor of South Carolina. And today, she, this, now she's the governor of the United Nations. Not she's the ambassador of the United Nations. But I said that on purpose. Because she put her foot down this week. Put her foot down up wherever it went. It went to the right place. But I can tell you that uh, just a few weeks ago, as uh, President Trump declared that Israel was the, uh, or that Israel's eternal capital was Jerusalem, and not just the eternal capital, but the governing capital as well, and that we would initiate plans to finally move our embassy after the last three presidents have said that's what we would do. He's actually following through on it, and it's amazing how many people are mad about it. They voted in the Senate 96 to 4, and some of the same senators that were for it are now against it. Um, but here's, in, here's what's interesting. So in the United Nations this week, the... UN Security Council, that's the five largest members of the United Nations, of which the United States is a member. Every one of them has what's called veto power. So unless they're all in complete unison, nothing really happens there. The United States never vetoes anything. I mean, we have just on very, very rare occasions. Well, this week we vetoed because we vetoed uh, a resolution that would have nullified President Trump's decision to declare Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Does that make sense? So the, the, the anti-Semites, now can I just be raw and do that? Can, is that all right? Y'all put up with me for six years. If y'all fire me over that, that's crazy. Um, you can find something better than that. <laughs> so, so that bunch of, listen, that people that hate God and hate the Jewish people because they're God's chosen people have determined that, you know, they're just not going to stand for it. And so the United States had to veto about that. And her words to them was, this will not be forgotten. Well, so just so you know, in the coming year, there's going to be a mess because the United States has veto uh, at the Security Council. But where they don't have veto power is in the General Assembly. So next Next year, you know how every year we let these uh, we let these killers and we let these uh, people that hate America onto American soil, so they can come to New York and stand there before all of the UN General Assembly and ha give a speech about how we're the great Satan and how we're horrible and wicked and we're oppressing the world. Yet we're feeding the world. Are you with me? Now, I'm being political a little bit. Can you tell? But the thing that I'm trying to tell you is this. In the next year, what they're going to do is they're going to try in the open general assembly to declare also that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the Ishmaelites, of the Arabs, of the Palestinians. Folks, you know where we're headed to? We're headed not to Middle East peace, but we're headed to Middle East conflict, which will in turn eventually lead to Middle East peace. You say, how? But the return of the Prince of Peace after seven years of extreme non-peace. 
All right, after seven years of extreme non-peace. You say, preacher, should I be worried about that? If you're saved, no. If you have lost loved ones, yes. So, now, all these things. God promised that to Isaac. The sign of the Abrahamic covenant. What's the sign that God was going to give to, the Abraham, to, to Abraham's seed that they were, in fact, part of this covenant, that they were blessed, which included Ishmael now, as far as the general blessing that's being given now, it is circumcision. Is circumcision. Now, but the beautiful thing here is God changed Abraham's name because he was going to make him a what? What's it mean? What does the name Abraham mean? Father of many or father of multitudes. That's exactly right. But he didn't just change Abram's name to Abraham. He changed Sarai's name to Sarah. Now, Sarah's name was changed as well. And the reason why he changed her name is because she was going to become the mother of kings. Now, what do you call a woman who gives birth to princes that become kings? You call her a queen. And the name Sarah means princess or queen. It means princess or queen. How beautiful. How beautiful is that? that it's only fitting that she who would give birth to kings or her seed would become kings. Her seed would be the father of kings, Isaac. And from him, the king of kings, that God gave her a new name. Do you know what God does when he makes a covenant with us? When you become a partaker of God's covenant, you get a new name. <laughs> I love it. The Bible tells us he hath given us a new name. The name of the redeemed, of his children. We have his name. We are washed in his blood. We are part of his family. We've been adopted in. We've been purchased by, with a great price. And oh, what a name he's given us. Child of the king. What are you tonight? You're nothing but a child of the king. You're nothing less than a child of the king. What joy ought to be on our faces when you think about who you are. You think for just a minute of all the people in your life that have ever looked down on you, whether it be at work, at home, out in public, sometimes in private. People that have ridiculed you, made fun of you, thought you'd never amount to anything, thought you'd always be a nobody and never be anything to anybody. God accounts you as a child of the king. Greater than anybody that's ever served in Congress or anyone that's ever held a senatorial position. Greater than any governor or any representative or any ambassador that's ever been known. You have access to a greater power and to a greater privilege than any lost person will ever know this side of eternity. You have access uh, to the very throne of grace tonight, not as a servant, but as a son and as a daughter. We have that tonight because we are descendants of Abraham, the father of many nations, and Sarah, who is the queen. <laughs> now I like that. <clears throat> of course, I mean that by faith. Now, lastly, number nine. So Abraham's got him a new name. He's the father of many nations, or the father of multitudes, the father of many. Sarah's got her a new name. She's a princess or a queen. Isaac, that's what God named their baby boy that was going to be born. About nine months after this ordeal right here. God said sometime in the next year, you're going to have a baby. And you're going to call him Isaac because that's what God called him. Do you know what's amazing? Is God knew your name before you was born too? <laughs> I'm sorry, it just tickles me. I grew up not liking Jonathan as a name. I, but you have to remember, you, you've heard my testimony. I didn't like anything about me. I didn't like, yeah, I couldn't stand myself. I didn't like the way I looked. I didn't like the way I sounded. I, I, I couldn't stand to hear my voice. I still can't. I don't know how you can either. Um, I'm sure you can't. I didn't like looking in the mirror because I didn't like who I saw on the outside or on the inside. Didn't like anything. But I didn't like my name. I wanted to be anybody but me. So I went by John, Johnny, JB. That one kind of stuck. Um, John, John. Hey, 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 hey. Do you know how many women in here drooled over a Kennedy named John John when they were younger? You have no idea because you're about 12 years old. Um, so, so, somebody tell me, give me an amen. 
Nobody wants to admit it. Some of you men, you know, you know what I'm talking about. These ladies did, did they not? So, but, uh, so John John's not a bad name. It may be now, but it wasn't back in the day. Uh, of course, I didn't get the Kennedy's money when I started wanting to be called John John either. <clears throat> Got sidetracked on history. Isn't that awful? But God knew his name before he was ever born. God knew your name before you was ever born. Guess what? When you was born, he didn't have to sit around and wait till your parents figured out what your name was going to be before he can write it down. He knew you by name. He told Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. Now, wait a minute. Jeremiah's mom and daddy formed him in the belly, didn't they? No. No, God did. Now, he might have used them to do it, but God did that. Oh, I love it. You know what's amazing? God called his name Isaac. Now, here's what all of us think about. God called his name Isaac because they laughed. Now, hold on just a minute. God called his name Isaac. Now, when we think of Isaac, we think laughter. Ha, ha, ha. We think of joy. But guess what? That's not the laughter that God named him. You see, God named him Isaac. Isaac means laughter or mockery. It means laughter or mockery. Do you know why? Two reasons. Because they laughed and mocked God. Are you listening to me? They didn't think that God could do that. They didn't think that God could use them at that age to have children. They laughed not because God told a joke. They laughed because they disbelieved. They had a lack of faith. Are you listening to me? And they laughed and they mocked God. So God gave them a permanent reminder of how good he is. And he said, you call that child Isaac. You call that child Isaac to always remember every time you look at that boy, that's your little miracle. And you didn't think I could do it. You didn't think I could do it. Every time I look in the mirror, you know what I see? I see mockery. I see mockery when I look in the mirror. When I look in the mirror, I see an Isaac staring right back at me because I look at a lot of people in my life that said, you'll never be nothing, you'll never be tr anything but trash, you're no good, you'll never account to anything, you'll always be sorry, a lazy, a bum, and, and, and you'll never have anything. I, I mean, grew up that. But at the same time, I see myself staring back at me as a mockery because I made a mockery of so much of my life and I despise God. God, leave me alone. Get away from me. I'm miserable with you. I'm miserable without you. And I was that way. But now I look and I see what God can really do, what God can really make. And folks, I'm glad to say and glad to give a good report tonight that what you see up here is not the finished product, but it has come a long way. I'm still a work in progress. But when I stand before you tonight, and when you look in the mirror tonight, you ought to see the same thing. All the messes that we try to make, and all the times that we doubt a big God, but every single one of us tonight are a walking, talking miracle. Every one of us. We don't deserve to be alive. We don't deserve to breathe God's good air. Nathan asked me the other day, what's the difference between oxygen and air? We had a long scientific discussion about that. I bored him to sleep where he didn't want to talk about that no more. He was done. Ready to talk about something different. But do you understand, we don't even deserve to breathe God's air. He made us in his image. But we messed that up. You say, hey, Adam did that. <laughs> I did a good enough messing up my own. I might have been born with a sin nature, but it took me to mess it up myself. Adam didn't do that for me. If Adam had been perfect, if my mom and daddy had been perfect, I'd have blew it. I'd have blew it all by myself. But God's good. And every one of us are miracles tonight. You say, preacher, what's a miracle about me? The miracle that you're not in hell tonight. Or the miracle that you're not going to hell. I'm talking about if you're saved this evening. You say, Preacher, well, I'm not sure if I'm saved. I think I am. I'm pretty sure. I might be. Folks, the Bible tells us that we can know that we have eternal life. If you're not 100% certain tonight, wait a minute, this is a Wednesday night, right? I'm not supposed to talk like this on a Wednesday. Just hang in there. If you're not 100% certain, that means that if you are not 
absolutely sure. We were talking about on our prayer list. There's a gentleman on our prayer list coming up 134. These, some of our first responders had to deal with it last week. There was a man coming home the other night or going somewhere in the wee hours of the morning. And then all of a sudden, something happened. Two cars came across. They somehow, well, somebody crossed in another lane. He was headed somewhere. And now he's laid up in the hospital. Another person's dead. Folks, the obituaries this morning had people in them. Had no intentions of being dead today. And somebody tomorrow will not make it to sunset. With Christmas presents already under the tree, plans for dinner already have been made. There'll be empty seats at somebody's table this year. God forbid that it's anybody in this church. God forbid that it's any of our loved ones, anybody that we know. But reality is, is we're not promised tomorrow. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. If you're not absolutely certain that if you used to drop dead today, that's plain English, then you need to be saved. And I'm here to tell you that even on a Wednesday night, even on a Wednesday night, you can be sure before you leave. Let's bow our heads for a moment. To preacher, we're just supposed to dismiss and go home tonight. We'll do that in a minute. But before we do that, I, I, I just... I want to ask you, do you know that you know that you know? Are you sure you hadn't been playing games? Are you sure you got something that's real? Are you sure it's good enough to take you to heaven? Are you sure that it's good enough to keep you from hell? Preacher, I, 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 don't, I just don't know if I believe in heaven or hell. Folks, I guarantee you, everybody in hell tonight believes in it. And I can tell you this, it's not worth the risk. I wonder tonight how many children of God I got in the house with heads bowed and eyes closed. You're not ashamed to lift that hand tonight. Preacher, I know I'm saved. I'm not ashamed to lift that hand. Lift it and hold it for just a moment. Hold it just for a moment. You can put your hands down now. Thank you so much. As far as I could see, every hand raised. As far as I could see, every hand of every person I believe might be old enough to understand what I'm talking about tonight had their hand raised. Father, I want to thank you that I'm a child of Abraham. I may not have any Jewish blood, but I'm washed in the blood. And that makes me of Abraham's seed tonight. And Father, I'm thankful that you'd have me as part of your family. Lord, there's nothing I can offer you. I can't offer you my money because, Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hill. I can't offer you my physical strength for Lord you hold the seas in your hands God I can't give you my eyes Lord you're able to see through to even our heart even our thoughts and our mind but, oh God tonight I can give you my praise and Lord I pray tonight that you'd receive our praise and our thanksgiving and our thankfulness Lord for what you've done for us Lord as we offer that to you tonight God I pray that in return for you making us righteous by the blood of the Lamb, that you'd help us to live right and thankful in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, good night. God bless you. I can't wait to see you on Christmas Eve. If I see you before, praise the Lord. But we're going to be here 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. Sunday school, preaching at 11, just like normal. And then we'll have us a good time. Can't wait to see you on Sunday.